to the text and the message. Father, we thank you so much, God, for your grace. The unmerited favor, Father, that you've shown us, Lord, when we deserved your wrath, Lord, you've given us your mercy and kindness. Father, where we were clothed in our own sin and rebellion against you, Father, you have offered the cloak of righteousness in Jesus Christ as a free gift. Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead in history, in time, in reality. And Father, that this is the solid rock upon which we stand. Lord, not our own good works, not our attempts to be pleasing or to be good little boys and girls, but Father, we rest in the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. So, Father, as we open the Scriptures, I pray, God, that you would illuminate our understanding, Lord, to what it means to, to, to receive or be participant of the election of grace. And, Father, to know what it means to be saved, not by works of righteousness, but, God, by grace and the works of Jesus Christ on our behalf. So, Father, take your word. Illuminate our understanding, God, and show us the truth of Jesus Christ that we might be set free from the bondage of sin and death and deception. God, we commit this message to you, the work of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, uh, Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 20. cover this for context, and then we're going to focus primarily on verses 5 and 6 and the application uh, of the Word of God uh, to our lives. So let's look at uh, Romans 10, verse 20. It says, But Isaiah, Paul is writing, But Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying... Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Well, we pick up here where we left off last week, and we're going to explore and kind of camp on this, this election of grace. And, and uh, you know, that's uh, one of the things that Henry Hazard told me when, when I was being discipled by him. He said, Ron, you want to make sure you can have topical studies. That's good. But you really need to faithfully just go verse by verse through the Word of God. Because otherwise you will camp on a hobby horse and you won't cover the whole counsel of Scripture. And so as we go through this, uh, through the Word of God, this is in, in everyone's Bible. Again, I didn't write these things in your Bible. The election of grace. It's in the Scriptures. And we find in chapters, uh, we, we've looked at uh, chapters 1 through 8 in Romans, we found how Paul methodically lays out the case against man, how Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We, we can simply look in the mirror and see that, uh, you know, that we've aged, that we're not that young and vital. Uh, uh, our skin isn't as elastic and, and fresh as, say, you know, my grandson and granddaughter. Their beautiful, unblemished faces are just... Wonderful, but something happens over time, and those faces mature and get older, and sin works its way out. We can see the effects of sin. The wages of sin is death, Paul writes in Romans 6.23. So we see obituaries in 
newspapers around the world. It doesn't matter what newspaper you look at. People die. There is, as I've said before, there is a coffin in every one of our future because we're sinners. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. So, so we need a Savior. And Paul makes the case, beginning in Romans chapter 4 through Romans chapter 8, how Christ came and that righteousness is not something that we derive from ourselves, but righteousness is a gift from God, just like sunshine, the air we breathe, our lives uh, in, in mortality that we have right now. As it was a gift, we didn't do anything to deserve being born. And so it is with righteousness. Righteousness is a gift to the guilty, not a reward for the righteous. Eternal life is a free gift in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died upon the cross for our sins. He was buried. He rose again to give us the gift of eternal life and to give us His very own righteousness itself. Jesus Himself in the Sermon on the Mount said, Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How many people have lived up to that standard to be perfect? And oh, by the way, you can't start now being perfect. Because if you failed before, guess what? You'll never be perfect in your own. Once you put an ounce of contaminant into a mixture, it will never be pure. And so it is, we have sinned against God. We sin and we continue to struggle with sin. We need more than a commandment or a religion because we're not perfect. So we need a Savior who will deliver us from our sin, and that's Jesus Christ. So the first eight chapters talk about this, but now we get into the, to the, to the, the really challenging chapters, I mean, which those are challenging. I mean, our pride bristles against this message of sin and condemnation and that we need a Savior. We're not good enough to save ourselves. But now we get into even the deeper parts of, of grace that our flesh recoils against. And that is the election of grace. And God is using Israel to demonstrate, to teach us about His doctrines and His ways. You know, there's no difference, the Scripture says, between Jew and Gentile. We're all the same. It's just that God used Israel and to, to reveal Himself and to bring salvation through the Jewish people. And we know that one day God is going to save all of Israel. And we see the working of God even today as God has gathered together all Israel from the four corners of the earth back into the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, we're witnessing a miracle here today as we look at Israel and see God unfolding and fulfilling His promises to Israel. It goes back to what we talked about this morning in Sunday school. It is impossible for God to lie. So you go back to the Old Testament prophets in Ezekiel. He says, the, the dry bones vision to Ezekiel. Can these bones live? Lord, thou knowest. And these bones were the whole house of Israel. And they began to rattle and come together. And then sinews and then flesh upon them. And then ultimately God will breathe His Spirit into them and they'll be born again. But we see the bones of Israel coming back together in 1948. We see Israel born as a nation, May 14, 1948. We see Israel attacked on all sides and yet surviving that bush that, that would burn but would not be consumed, that nation of Israel. We see the Six-Day War in which Israel miraculously defeats Egypt, Syria, and Jordan in six days expanding her territory. God is faithful. That's my point. God is faithful. And we can look at Israel and see the faithfulness of God to, to His people. And so now we get into the text here in, in Romans, and we see, though, that Israel, Israel has, in, in large part, rejected God's revelation through Jesus Christ, their own Messiah. They rejected their own King, their own Messiah. Verse 21 says, But to Israel, he says, All day long I've stretched forth my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying or contradictory people. So we've looked at over the past uh, few weeks that Israel primarily, largely, and even to this day, is still in a state of rebellion against God. We've talked about in the previous weeks how, how the third time is the charm for the, for the Jewish people. Is they're, they're striving to once again rebuild the, 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 the temple on the Temple Mount. And to re, 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 uh, convene the sacrifices, the blood of the bulls and the goats and the sheep, which can never forgive sin, because they have trampled underfoot, they have rejected the blood of Messiah, which washes away sin. All these things were a foreshadowing. And so, so God has stretched out his, his arms, pleading with Israel, and they remain disobedient and contradictory. Not only are they disobedient to the gospel message which says to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness sake to everyone that believes. 
That was back in Romans 10.4. But they also, it's, it, it's bad enough that they're disobedient. And oh, by the way, like most people, Jew or Gentile, they are disobedient. But also gainsaying, they are contradictory in that they contradict the Word of God in their, in their message, their lifestyle. So the question Paul asked in, these, he's, he's out, outstretched arms and they remain disobedient and gainsaying or contradictory people. Has God cast away His people? It's a natural question to ask. And the answer of Paul is God forbid. So exhibit A, that God has not cast off His people, is Paul himself. He says, I also, I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away His people, which He foreknew. And so last week we kind of got really into this, the foreknowledge of God, the reservation of God, His, His gathering together, and then the remnant that it produces. And last week, if you remember, I talked about, remember when, when mom would make her brownie mix or make that chocolate cake, and she'd scrape out the batter and put it in there and put it in the oven, and, and there's that remnant left. And you, you lick the bowl, right? I would always want to lick the bowl. Sometimes mom would get the bowl before me. I'm like, hey, what's up with that? You know I'm supposed to get the bowl. So she would normally preserve it for me, but, but there's that remnant you just lick. And so God has preserved a remnant of people. And the reality is, when we look at verse 21 again, God has stretched forth His hands to a disobedient, gainsaying people. That is why election, a remnant, is necessary. Because if God did not choose us to be saved, then no one would be saved. Because we're obstinate, hard-hearted people by nature. As I've shared before, we talked when we talked about the Apostle Paul last week, the Apostle Paul, was the farthest thing from his mind was to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Remember we talked about his conversion, how he, he had letters. He had, he, not only did he have letters to go grab Christians and bring them back and, and, and imprison them and, and persecute and even murder them, but he himself sought out the permission from the high priest. And he is riding on a horse to go and, and, and murder Christians. And he's not sitting there thinking, man, I wonder if Jesus really is the Messiah. I really want to know the truth about Jesus. That's not even in his mind at all. He has bloodlust in his heart. He is going to kill Christians. And God says, no, I'm going to choose you of all people to show my grace and make you into the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? Everything okay over there? Okay. Um, so, uh, and so it was in my case when I got saved. Again, I came to the dinner table when the pastor came simply to make to satisfy the arrangement with my mother. I didn't want to believe in Jesus. I didn't I don't want salvation. I simply wanted to fulfill the agreement I made with my mom so I would not be grounded anymore and I could continue to party. So I was just going to give the preacher what he wanted to hear. I'll be a good little boy. I promise you, can I go party now? That was in my mind. But God had different plans. What I did not realize is that from eternity past, He had foreknown me and elected or chosen me unto salvation. And at that precise moment in time was the moment that God had ordained that I should receive eternal life by faith in Jesus Christ. So Israel has not been cast away. We see that Paul was exhibit A. Then we see Elijah, the, the example of Elijah, uh, do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he makes intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, they dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. So Elijah was making the case to God. Remember, he had, he had just had this tremendous victory over the prophets of Baal. Um, God had demonstrated in tremendous power that he was the true and living God, where the prophets of Baal, they did their dances and cut themselves and and, and were bleeding to death and you know, probably getting weak and so forth. And, and for some reason, Baal just wasn't answering them. And then God answered, Jehovah answered with fire. He consumed the sacrifice. And not only did he consume the sacrifice, but he pour, uh, Elijah had poured water over the sacrifice. So it's, it's kind of like this brothy stew sitting there, the sacrifice. And the fire of God licked up not only the sacrifice, but all the water as well. So it's very clear that Jehovah was God and Baal was not God. And so he fled because they were after him. And so he's crying out to God, Oh God, God, they're all against me. They've, they've killed your prophets. Dig down thine altars and I alone, I'm, I'm left alone. I'm the last one. 
and they're seeking my life. But what was the answer of God unto him? He said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. God had reserved 7,000 men. And th those men were identified that they had not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, the prophet was not aware of these people, but God was aware of them. These 7,000 dispersed throughout Israel who had not worshipped the idols uh, of Israel and had not bowed to the, to the image of Baal. So, we see that God had reserved in Exhibit B uh, these 7,000 men. And the reason they did not bow their knee to Baal was not because they were uh, of some greater moral superiority. It was because God had preserved them and kept them from that evil. So, um, so we see this, this reservation, and verse 5 says that they are a remnant. Even so, then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And this is the sticky part we talked about last week. The election of grace. We think in terms of an election, we have elections every, here in the, in the United States every two years. We have a vote congressionally. And we vote for our president. And an election is a choice. It is a choice, the collective choice of the American people to, to determine our leaders. Okay, that's our election. Now God has chosen also. And that choice that he makes of the remnant is based upon grace, not works. Verse 6 makes this clear. That the election of grace, if it is by grace, then it is, is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So this, these are the passages that we're going to really kind of soak in and, 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 and meditate upon uh, this afternoon here. So we see in the beginning, we see even so at this present time, there is a remnant, and that remnant exists according to the election of grace. Now remember that the text opened up, has God cast away his people? And, and Paul answers with a qualifying answer. He says, no, he's not cast away his people whom he foreknew. So there is a majority that are going to be cast away for their disobedience and rebellion and gainsaying and contradiction of what God has commanded that everyone should believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But there will be a remnant that he will not cast away. And the only reason there is that remnant that still exists, whether it be Jew or Gentile, is not because of the will and decision of the people, but because of the will and choice and loving kindness of God himself expressed to mankind. Now remember we talked about in Romans chapter 10 how a potter, the illustration that Paul gave was, does not a potter have authority to make out of one lump of dough, to make one vessel of uh, one vessel unto honor, and to make out of the same lump, lump a vessel unto dishonor? And the obvious answer is, of course he does. Then he transfers that to God and says, doesn't God have the, the same authority out of the lump of Adam to make a vessel of mercy and to, to make vessels of wrath? We have to understand, you see, that we deserve the wrath of God. We have to understand that we are, we are morally, we're depraved, we're sinful, wicked people in our heart. And if God were simply to take his hand off of us, the wickedness that we would each commit is, is unlimited. Because it's already bound up in our hearts because we're children of Adam, the chief sinner of humanity, the, who, the one who introduced sin and death into the human family. Adam, our first, our first father, the, 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 the father of all humanity. Physically speaking. So the remnant is what is, remains from the, the, this casting away. And the present time, there is a remnant today, according to the election of grace. And as we look at Israel as the example, and I, I talked about Dr. Fruchtenbaum last week, he is an example of the remnant of grace. Here is a Jewish man who has come to saving faith in Jesus Christ as his Savior. And there are other uh, Jews who have believed upon Jesus Christ. I met several of them when I went to Israel. They came and talked about their ministry to the Jewish people. And I was looking at the remnant, what Paul is talking about, this remnant of Israel that God has preserved. 
And this preservation is by the election of grace. And so um, we talked about last week how it's one thing to say, okay, I can accept the choice of God, the election of God. Okay, so, so I'm going to perform for God. I'm going to do some good things. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to do this and this. And God will then choose me because based upon my works. But now it gets a little bit more dicey because it says, no, no, no. The basis of his election is grace. It's unmerited favor. It's not based upon what you're doing. And therefore, it takes salvation completely out of our hands and places it entirely into the hands of God Almighty. And what do we read in Romans chapter 9? These very difficult passages to digest for our, our, our pride. And it says very clearly in Romans chapter 9, verse 15 and, uh, 15 and 16, it says, For he saith, God saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. See, we have something inside of us that says, no, I have something to, to contribute. I have something to say in my own salvation. And the final, the final decision is not in the hands of God. The final decision of salvation is in my hands. You see, we want to cling to something to say, I must have a say in this decision. But we find that God is sovereign. He doesn't seek our counsel. He is all-knowing and all-wise, and He reveals His mercy to us. And He reveals it. He gives mercy to those that He chooses to give mercy to. That is the election of grace, and that is why we recoil against it as human beings. I mean, it's bad enough to, to our flesh and to our pride to say, you can do nothing for your salvation. That's an entirely different thing, to, an even uh, more grievous blow to us to say, not only that, but even the faith that you place in the Lord Jesus Christ is a gift of God to you, based on the election of grace. So we see this chain. There was an election of grace, which produced those who he reserved, and those whom he reserved or, or left over for himself became the remnant of, and the remnant were manifest in the time of uh, Elijah. They were manifest that they did not bow the knee to Baal. That identified them as the remnant, those that God had chosen by election. Now, verse 6, we see oil and water. And now, you know, oil and water just don't mix, right? Well, guess what? Grace and works do not mix. You cannot blend them together. There is a passage, a, a, a teaching within the LDS faith that says, for it is by grace you are saved after all that you can do. Now think that through, that saying. For it is by grace you are saved after all that you can do. That passage is essentially saying that you will never receive grace for two fundamental reasons. Number one, as the text says, that... Um, Oops, I'm on the wrong page here. Uh, the text says that if it is by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. That's kind of a complicated saying, but when you unpack it all, it says that, that grace and works do not mix. And the teaching that is taught in the LDS faith in this, in this deceptive and satanic passage, this counterfeit passage is, it is by grace you're saved after all that you can do. How many people have done all that they can do for God? No one. No one has ever done all they can do for God. Now I hate to say this, but you're admitting you're spiritual slackers. You're all a bunch of spiritual slackers here. You could have done more, but you didn't do more. In fact, what do we do? We do the opposite. We're lawbreakers. We've broken the law of God includes the pastor. So maybe that's why we've got a small church. Uh, but uh, hopefully the two viewers aren't watching right now as I said that. But uh, uh, So uh, uh, it's a deceptive lie. You see, uh, you cannot mix grace and works. So I, I, I did some math here. 
If you take grace and then add works to it, grace plus works equals what? Works. works. That's right. Because ultimately the grace part is like, okay, here's the grace, but now everything hinges upon you doing that one thing that you've got to do. Once you blend in grace and works together, it is no more grace. It becomes works-based. And works, righteousness, can never, ever, ever work. Why? Because the Bible says all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. If you picked your top five, you say, okay, I'm going to make my resume for God, and we're going to talk about our resume for God right now. We're going to talk about the resumes that we've got right now that we're hoping we're going to spit, shine, and polish and hopefully get into the pearly gates, right? We're going to talk about our resume. Um, if we picked our top five and said, okay, I'm going to put my top five bullets. Boom, 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 top five. Right here they are. The Bible says you scoop all that up and squeeze it out and it's filthy rags. That's the best you have to offer God. Why? Because our motives are impure. I mean, I, I've said it before, if our hearts were opened up and projected onto a big screen, we would. this church would be fragmented into nothing because of the wickedness of our own hearts. See, we can sit piously in church with, with our clothes on and conceal our wicked thoughts. Boy, he's long-winded today. Oh, he always, talk, he always gives that same example. Oh, good night. There he goes again talking about his salvation experience. We all heard that, Ron, a thousand times. Uh, but fortunately you can look pious and not reveal that you're thinking these thoughts or you're like how long has he got left because the roast is looking good today and I'm really hungry um, but you can look pious mm, amen you know we just know when to respond amen 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 uh, we're evil and those are just the things I can talk about well, I don't talk about the other things that are deeper more wicked thoughts that we have that we all have it shows the heart of man is wicked, and God looks at the heart. He's not looking at the exterior. He looks at the heart. Religion says, let's guess up the outside. But God says, no, I'm looking at your heart. And that's why Jesus Christ rebuked the Pharisees, because they were all about externals. Oh, I do this, I do this, I put money in the plate, da, 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 da. And God looked into the heart and said, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. Outside, you're beautiful and ornate, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and the stench of death. So, so we see that um, our resume has to be polished up here or radically changed because if gr by grace it's no more works. If the election is by grace, then there cannot be works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So yes, grace plus works does not equal grace. Grace plus works equals works. And that is why this, this damnable heresy, this subtle it sounds so good. You know, oh, after all you can do, then he'll give you that extra icing of grace to get you to the very top. When they fail to teach that all of your righteousnesses are as filthy rags, you cannot please God by your performance because we are sinners. We violate the law of God. We do not live up to his holy standard. Now, work is work. Now, what is a work? You think through, what is a work? Well, a work is anything that I do. I, I exert energy that is required to do that. So, Baptism is a work. Are you trusting in your baptism to go to heaven? Is that on your one of your top five bullets on your resume? Well, guess what? The election is not by works. It's by grace. Are you counting on the fact that you, oh, I'm very pious. I came to church today. And then you might even boast it. You know, drop some fat. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't go because I was at church. Yeah. I really wanted to be there, but I was at church. Oh, you weren't at church? I was. Um... <laughs> So you don't go to church. Isn't that sad? The kind of the church lady, remember the church lady from Saturday Night Live? This caricature of a self-righteous churchgoer, do-gooder. Oh, isn't that special? She was always judging and condemning of everyone, but very subtle about it, right? Um, so uh, where was I going with that? The church lady. So a work, that's what I was talking about, a work. Uh, writing a check or saying a prayer or being dunked or putting on special clothing or going to a ritual, whatever it is, is a work, it cannot produce righteousness. It cannot wash away the sins that we have already committed. And that's the lie and the deception of religion. Religion appeals to the pride of man and says, you can do it. We're just here to help you. We'll help assist you fulfill the works necessary so that God hopefully will accept you. 
And we've got, a, we've, got a, we've got our own menu of works. You've got other religions, they've got their menu of works, and we've got our menu of works, but I think, I think you'll like ours. It's funny how they'll always, one of the menu items is cutting a check, right? <laughs> Religion always wants a little bit more money. Okay? We do have an offering plate right over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you won't go to heaven by putting a check in there. We'll just keep the lights on, that's all. Um, so, um, that's the nature of, re of religion. But now, what is grace? I love the acrostic of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. When you think about grace, grace is not the absence of work. It is an absence of my work. It is work that has been done by somebody else, and I'm the beneficiary of all their labor. Amen. Okay, so Jesus Christ has done the labor, all of the groundwork, all of the essentials. In fact, his final words upon the cross is Tetelestai, paid in full, it is finished. Not, I've laid the foundation and now you better get to work. I've, I'm giving you a leg up, now you get going. No, he said, it's finished. It's finished. It's done. Tetelestai, paid in full. If you have a $100 bill and someone, you're indebted $100 to someone and someone comes up and pays the $100 debt, you're free. You're no longer obligated. And that's what Christ has done in dying upon the cross. He has freed us from the bondage and the debt of sin that we have before God. He paid the fullness of it. So in other words, it costs great effort and great labor. In fact, Isaiah says, Lord, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? When God created, He just spoke. It was His finger work. It was... Like, like just this simple tapestry. But the power of God was manifested when He broke the power of sin and saved the wicked. When He died on the cross. What the Pope says was God's greatest failure was in fact the greatest victory. When Jesus Christ died on that cross because He paid for all of the sin of all humanity in all time. In one event. It is finished. Paid in full. That's grace, that labor, there was tremendous labor involved, but we're the beneficiaries of grace. We receive it absolutely free. It's like when you go to, a, you go to someone, uh, a banquet is set before you, and in Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2, is this great comparison. It's, this wonderful banquet is set before us, and the only people that are invited are those that have no money. I have nothing to offer but a big appetite. And wow, this feast is spread. And you mean I just get to eat and eat and eat as much as I want? Yes. Well, someone had to prepare that meal. I, I give the illustration when I'm at the rescue mission all the time. These people have come, and they're going to be recipients of grace. There are people who are working. They have invested time. They've set aside time to prepare a meal. There are folks who've sacrificed financially to purchase. You know, you ever drive by there? It's like, uh, we need eggs. Thank you. You know, somebody, somebody cuts a check and buys eggs and brings it in there. But the people receive the grace, the benefit of the labor of others, and they get to just sit on eat for free. That's a great picture of salvation. God has provided this for free, but there's tremendous work and tremendous effort that's put into it. But it's God who does the effort, and we're the beneficiaries of that grace. Okay? So we have election, and we're going to get into this election a little bit more this concept of the election, but, it, but it's, it's of grace. It's by, we can't offer God anything. Okay? So, um, so the key thing to remember is grace plus works equals works. And there are many counterfeit gospels. This lordship salvation issue is grace plus works. It's just subtly defined. Oh yes, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but you've got to repent of your sins. You've got to break the bondage yourself. First, break the shackle of your sin and then believe in Jesus and start living right and believe in Jesus and then God will save you. Now, that's trying to put grace and works together. Because the essence of repentance of sin in the context that they describe it, which is a perversion of repentance, is to stop sinning. Well, guess what? That's what the law says. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. When they tell you that they're saying keep the law and believe in Jesus, you cannot add the two together. You cannot add law and grace. So let's look at the resume. Let's look at the resume of grace. But before we do that, I want to just share what my resume was before I had that epiphany moment. Hello, Jesus Christ paid it all when I was 16. 
Here was my resume as, as I wrote these things down. And remember, I was saved at the age of 16. Okay, remember, remember that, it'll be a test afterward. Um, I was 16, so I didn't have, I hadn't accumulated like decades of sin. I had one and a half decades of, of really uh, involvement in sin. But here was my resume. And I had a very sensitive conscience to it, conscience as a kid. I was very sensitive, but I had an outward projection. And that, that resume that I had in my mind was, I am better than other people. I'm better than other people. Here I was 16 years old, and yet I had this sense, this pride puffed up. I'm better than other people. And how, what was my evaluation? It read, led to that conclusion. Number one, I, I obeyed my parents and was more compliant to my parents than my friends were. Oh, you, uh -huh, you, you talk back to your mom? Mm, uh -huh, I don't do that as much as you do. I'm better than you are. That makes me feel good. I obeyed and I was more compliant. I was a good student. I made great grades until I didn't. But boy, I was a good student, and so that must be worth something to God that I am a good student, I study hard, and I listen to my mom, and I don't, I'm, I'm more compliant than my friends and my baseball team and at school. And you know what? Uh, I'm not in much trouble. I wasn't at the principal's office until after 16, which is uh, <laughs> complicated, but it wasn't until after I got saved that I really became a hellion uh, externally. But... Um, um, uh, I, I'm not. A, I'm a good boy. I'm a good boy. Ronnie's a good boy. And boy, didn't my granny? She always confirmed that to me. My granny thought I was the best boy in the world. I had red hair. I was the carrot top. Uh, I was the ginger. I didn't know that word at the time until I came to Utah. Ginger. I was a carrot top uh, when I was a kid. And uh, and so I was granny's favorite, and she made my favorite because I was a good boy. Ronnie's a good boy, and she'd secretly give me money. It's great being a good boy. I didn't cuss much. I did not cuss. I was not a cusser until after, till later in, in my life. Um, so that was in my credit. Uh, I'm better than other boys, and they were cussing at, at a young age. That I didn't cuss. Um, I, at that time, I did not drink or use uh, uh, illicit uh, drugs or anything like that. I wasn't drinking alcohol because I, I was focused on studies and being a good boy. I was externally moral. Uh, I shared the story with Jana uh, when we were kids. Uh, we thought it would be fun to start a fire in Miss Forwood's uh, carpet. Uh, and so, because she was out of the room, so like, wouldn't it be fun to start this fire? So we, we started a fire, and I was with my friend Lynn Avery. Well, Lynn was a bad boy, and I was a good boy. And so when the fire started to get out of hand, it was starting to burn up. To, like there was a bed here, we were between two beds, and we'd lit the fire in the floor, and the fire started to get up to the sheets, and we started to kind of panic. So we grabbed this big duck. It's about this big. It was flattened out in the toy chest because she babysat a lot of children. So he had these toys, these old toys. So we grabbed that thing and we put the fire out. And then we very cleverly laid the duck over the fire. The burned our carpeting so she wouldn't know. Um, somehow though she, she saw past the duckling. Maybe it was the burning smoke. Maybe, I don't know exactly how she figured out we'd start a fire. But anyway, she came in and this is back in the day, she got a switch and she spanked yeah. bad boy Lynn. But good boy Ronnie, not happening. Because I was a good boy. And she didn't see my involvement and it was all Lynn. You must have been responsible for this. Uh, I escaped that spanking. But anyway, um, externally I was moral. Oh, and let me add to my resume, I was a Christer Christian. I went to church every Christmas and Easter that mom made me go. If she made me go, I was there. I was there, though. I was in church. I attended church even though I was coerced. I became quite an artist. I could draw things very well when the pastor was droning on and on and on. And uh, But I was in church, see. And finally, I didn't maliciously hurt other people. I was a good kid. I mean, I didn't, I didn't go out to hurt others. I got along with kids and, and it wasn't something that I did actively. But here's what I discovered with my polished resume. I was still empty. I was dissatisfied. And like we've studied before in, in the Gospels, the, the rich young ruler, I was lacking. What, what do I lack? I've, I've kept all those things, so Lord, what do I still lack? There was a gnawing sense of guilt. I was aware and very sensitive 
of, of my sin. And, and, and so I try to improve my resume and polish it, but somehow the polished resume did not deal with my guilt and sin issue in my own heart. And so I struggled with this internally. And ultimately, I knew I was condemned. I could not escape it. In fact, I've shared this before. Somehow this passage in Hebrews kept coming into my mind, probably from the droning pastor. At one point, God said, this seed will land in his heart. I'm going to nurture that one. And it's the passage that said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I would think in my con con condemnation internally as I'm trying to wrestle through, okay, I'm going to die and I'm going to go to hell. I am going to hell. And then I would think, well, okay, I'm going to go to hell, but surely after a trillion years, God will say, that's enough. You've pun been punished enough and he will let he will release me from the, from the tortures of hell for my sin. And that verse came into my mind. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Lord spoke into my heart and said, If Jesus Christ said it's eternal damnation yesterday, He means it's eternal damnation today, and it means it's eternal damnation tomorrow. There will be no escape. Jesus Christ is unchanging. The condemnation is real, and it is eternal, and you will not escape it if you enter into that condemnation. And it terrified me. So that was, that was my best. That was my resume. That was my personal resume of works at that time. So let's look here real quickly at these passages. The resume of grace. Now let's look at the resume of grace. It begins with the foreknowledge of God, which, which causes the cause, the foreknowledge of God, and it causes election, God choosing. 1 Peter 1, verse 2 says that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. It begins in eternity past. The resume of grace began in eternity past when God foreknew little Ron Tabor, the good boy, with the evil heart. From eternity past, it began then. And when is that? eternity past. It never had a beginning. It was always in the heart of God that God was going to save me by grace. He didn't look down and say, Ron is a pretty good little boy. I'll just polish him up a little bit and he'll be good. He'll be, can be a preacher one day. No, he foreknew me. He chose me based on his foreknowledge. The election of grace. He chose me before I was even born. Before he even said in Genesis 1, let there be light and there was light. Before that happened, eternity passed. And by the way, he's God. He's always been he foreknew me and He chose me. Now look at this text. It says, uh, it, we're elect, we're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. I thought it was most of my good works. No, it's the foreknowledge of God the Father. I'm chosen through the sanctification of the Spirit. The word sanctification means God set me apart as a remnant. He reserved me to Himself. Sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Unto what? Obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's obedience, Ron. There's works. No, it's obedience to the gospel. Obedience to the gospel is faith. You believe. That's when you obey the gospel. I was sanctified, set apart by the Spirit of God, based on the foreknowledge of God. I was chosen through the sanctification of the Spirit, and I was chosen to obedience. I was chosen to obedience and sprinkling the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it is the blood of Christ that removes our sin. We must come underneath the blood of Christ by faith. So notice the triune God. The Father foreknew me. The Spirit had se separated me. And Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. We see the triune God choosing me for these things. Now we look at election. So foreknowledge begets election. Now what does election beget? It, it begets being set apart. Romans 11.4 But what saith the answer of God to him, to Elijah? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So election is the cause of God setting apart. And that's the, the word sanctified again. So we see that in the, the 7,000 whom God set apart at the time of Elijah. The reservation of sanctification being set apart Produces the remnant itself. And that's at 11, Romans 11, 5, which we talked about. Even so then at this present time, also there's a remnant according to the election of grace. 
The remnant exists not because they are super spanky spectacular, but because God has chosen them by grace. And the election of grace sets, creates the remnant, and the remnant receives salvation. Romans 9.27 says, uh, Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, Elijah, or, or excuse me, Isaiah, uh, also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So there is this multitude of Israel, and the multitude of Israel is disobedient and contradictory to God's will. And so God says, I must set aside a remnant, and they will be saved, they will be delivered. That's what salvation is, to be delivered from the wrath to come. The remnant will be delivered, will be saved. Okay? So now we get down to the nitty-gritty here. Let's make personal application. This has been high theological stuff, but I wanted to set the groundwork uh, so that we understand how our salvation comes. And again, this is the text set before us. Salvation is by grace through faith. How do I personally receive what God has ordained in eternity past throughout the eons of of not only time, but in beyond into eternity past, how does it come down to a point of time, application, appropriation to me, an individual sinner? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We see, first of all, that salvation is by grace. It's unmerited favor. But how do we receive it? It's by faith. You believe the gospel. And this is the foolishness of the cross. The foolishness of preaching. If you will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. It's that simple. If you will believe the message that I'm preaching today, if you'll receive it that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, if you'll simply receive that as the truth and agree with God about that message, you will be saved. That grace that had been prepared for you from eternity past will be administered to you in time and space the moment you believe. It's by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves. So even the faith, like, oh, okay, I better muster some faith. Whatever that means, I'm going to muster faith. Uh-oh. Uh, there. Is that salvation? I didn't feel anything. I guess nothing happened. No. <clears throat> faith is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. That moment that that preacher came to my house and he, he shared with me the gospel, and he said, would you like to receive this? <laughs> And what I had bargained for was happening right in front of me. I was saying yes to Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, what time out here? I just came to this meeting so I wouldn't be grounded anymore. Not so I could become, you know, a Jesus, you know. That wasn't part of my plan, but God revealed His Son to me at that moment, and I believed at 16. And I keep going back to this because I can so clearly talk through these things and what happened in my heart and my mind as I was thinking through all these things and what Christ died for me. For me, it was very clear. It wasn't for the world, you know. Yeah, I'll just blend in with the world and hopefully swim into heaven somehow, get in the back door. No, He died for me. It became real to me at that moment. He died for my sins, the sins that I anguished over, the sins that I knew I'd go to hell for. He died for me for those sins. It became apparent to me. We're saved by grace, it's not yourselves, a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You see how this is a work of God creating a new creature? A workmanship in Christ. He took that lump of Adam called Ron Tabor that came down through the eons to, to you know, 1966 when I was born. He took that lump of Adam that rotten lump of Adam, and made a vessel of mercy. I became his workmanship. I was created unto good works. Now, I'm not saved by good works, but he's fashioned each of us so that we will do good works. So we will love one another, we'll serve one another, we'll be obedient to the call to preach the gospel. There's many, many work, good works that we can do. He's called us to those things, but they don't save us. Acts 13, verse 48, I have verse 38 in the paper, it says, but it's actually verse 48. 
talks about um, those who are ordained to eternal life believe. Let me read it to you. Acts 13. I forgot to write it down here. Acts 13, verse 48 says, And when the Gentiles heard this, the preaching of the word, when they heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Notice the ordination produced the faith, not the other way around. As many as believed were ordained. No, it says, as many as were ordained to eternal life, they believed. They responded to Paul's preaching with faith. They received it. It's true. I believe it. It's real. Romans 12, 3 finally says, Paul writes, we'll get to this hopefully before the end of summer. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. The word for dealt means he has bestowed or he has distributed the measure of faith to every man. Now I want to put this in the context as written in. First of all, Paul is speaking to believers. I used to think that this verse meant that God dispensed to every human being a measure of faith. And then you had that faith, and then you got to choose, hmm, will I use this faith for salvation, or will I not use it for salvation? It's my choice. That's not what the text is saying. God, God's, you know, over the years revealed to me, uh, Ron, okay, if, if people die in their sins, it's because of unbelief. So how can they have faith if they're in a state of unbelief? You cannot have faith when you're in a state of unfaith. <laughs> faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So Paul is speaking to the brethren here. He's given the measure of faith to everyone that, is a, that, is, that Paul is addressing as the brethren, which he says very clearly, in, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. These are the people to whom God has given faith to. It's a gift. That's very clear. God has dealt the measure of faith. Faith is not something we produce ourselves. It is not something that we, we choose to exercise or not to exercise. It is the result of the revelation of Christ to our heart. And that is brought about by the election of grace. So now I close with my grace resume now. What is my resume now for heaven? What's my grace resume now? Ron Tabor was foreknown by God the Father. I was foreknown by God the Father. I didn't even know that. I did not even know that until I was 16. In fact, I didn't even know it at 16. I just knew Jesus was like, He's really my Savior. And I was so excited. Okay, here's a quiz. What did I do the first thing after he left? Called your buddy. I called my buddy, my drinking buddy, Nigel. I called him and I told him, hey, I was born again. He wasn't excited as I was. He quickly changed the topic. But anyway, he got saved later. Um, so I, I'm foreknown by God the Father. Um, I was chosen, elected according to great God's grace in eternity past. I was set apart by the Holy Spirit, reserved unto salvation as part of the remnant. I was dealt a measure of faith when the gospel was preached to me at the age of 16. And Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. And when I believed, God put me in Christ, and His death became my death. His burial, my burial. His resurrection, my resurrection. So that everything that was appropriated through Christ became mine because I was fused into Christ at that very moment of faith. Notice my grace resume is all glory to God. I have nothing to boast of myself. I can't preach my way into heaven. I can't write checks and pay my way into heaven. There is nothing I can do. It is all the work of God, and that is grace. Imagine someone so foolish as to worry about whether or not the sun was going to rise. Oh, we do. We have scientists that worry about that. Thank God we don't have to worry about that. It's grace. God caused the sun to rise and to set precisely at the right time. So precise that we can set our calendar, our clock. The sun will set on this day, in ten years, on this day, at this time. Boom. And that's exactly when it's going to go down. God is faithful. 
So the question is today, have you believed upon Jesus Christ? You want to know if you're the elect? Respond to the gospel message. Believe that Jesus Christ died for you. Believe that he was buried. Believe that he rose again from the dead. And you will know you have received salvation by grace and you were elect by grace. All you have to do to, to, to go to hell is just keep working. Keep striving. And you will get the just reward for every thought, every deed, every word you've said. God will give you justice. But believe me, you do not want his justice. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, this is such a, a, a controversial topic. And Father, I remember how when I first learned of this, I recoiled against it, and I got so angry at my good friend who brought this message to me. I was so upset. And yet, Father, over time, you've revealed to me the truth of it. Your word means what it says. And so, God, help us to submit to your sovereignty. But Lord, not just to to have a doctrinal foundation, but God, to find the peace and the joy that comes in knowing Christ. Father, knowing that, that faith is not something that I chose to exercise, and therefore, if I chose to exercise, it's something I could choose to not exercise in the future and be lost again. But Father, it is a part of this beautiful tapestry of grace, God that has been from eternity past and will go to eternity future as we're glorified and we will be there as we sang in amazing grace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. God, we thank you for the amazing grace, God, that washes us of the deepest stains of sin and gives us in its place the righteousness of Christ, the perfection of your own holiness, Father and the gift of eternal life. We love you, Lord. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name.